I would like to thank Professor Antonio Souza Ribeiro, Boaventura de Souza Santos, and all colleagues involved in the perfect organization of this colloquium. It is indeed a great honor and joy to be able to join you in the celebration of both Boaventura de Souza Santos' work and the 40th anniversary of SES, Centro de Estudos Sociais. Let me also extend my gratitude to Alexandre, Alexandre Pereira and Inês Costa for their kindness and for their willingness to help us in every circumstance. This morning, I was going to present to you an ontology of Boaventura de Souza Santos, a poetry I organized along with the Latin American theologian Carlos Mendoza Alves, Los Limites de la Palabra, In the Limits of the Word, which was presented in Mexico last year. However, while preparing this talk, a new hypothesis concerning the role of poetry in Boaventura de Souza Santos' intellectual project occurred to me, and I would like to share it with you this morning. And so the paper is now called Poetry as Radical Knowledge, Boaventura de Souza Santos Thought Experiments. Let me start by reading to you Boaventura de Souza Santos, 37, one of the 139 epigrammas para sentimentalizar pedras, published in a book published in 2015. I will always read the first in Portuguese, then I will provide a translation. 37. Escrevo devagar, muito devagar. Assim, é quase impossível enganar-me a respeito do que não escrevo. If Boaventura allows me, I will read the translation. 37. I write slowly, very slowly. Thus, it is almost impossible to fool myself about what I do not write. In this striking epigram, we find one of the driving forces of Boaventura's poetry, namely, the sharpness of a gaze whose task of the translator consists in turning upside down hierarchies and failures. What is not yet written has already become poetical matter. Indeed, any possible absence can always be converted into a future project. Take, for instance, the first stanza of the poem Aviso, published in Da Janela Presa no Andaime, a book of 2009. Aviso. A cidade começa aqui. Para trás fica uma sombra incompleta, gravada no céu simplificado das origens. Warning. The city begins here. Behind it remains an incomplete shadow engraved in the simplified sky of origins. Roots, origins, stable meanings are clearly not Boaventura's cup of tea. Rather, his worldview embraces a precariousness as a welcoming challenge, insofar as it requires a reaction, prompting movements towards alternative, alternative futures. We should only be afraid of the incomplete shed shadows of the past if and only if we were attached to it and detach oneself from any reverence regarding the tradition understood as a monument is a recurring theme in Boaventura's poetry. Let us read it together Contra as Ruinas, also published in Da Janela Presa ao Andaime. Contra as Ruinas. Não me reculo por anos de pedras, nem pelos nomes velhos, cobiçados por turistas. Sou filho bastardo das tempestades irreparáveis. Não nasci na Itália. Tenho medo das ruínas. Against the ruins. I do not measure myself by neither years of stone 
nor ancient names coveted by tourists. I am a bastard son of irreparable tempests. I was not born in Italy. I fear ruins. How not to fear them being born in Portugal? That is to say, in Boaventura's own words, even in its moment of historical apogee, Portugal was a semi-peripheral empire, as he has conceptualized the Portuguese colonial history in dialogue with Immanuel Wallerstein's theory of the world system and its triangular dynamics involving few centers, multiple peripheries, and the mediation of some semi-peripheries. Therefore, a Calibanized prosper cannot but be afraid of ruins, for they might emerge without any warning, and above all, with the swiftness of irreparable tempests. Let, no, let me now take a step back after this initial presentation of some poems. Surprisingly, to me at least, the poetry of Boaventura de Souza Santos has not yet been fully acknowledged. It is as if we cannot help to frame it as a sort of hobby, pastime, a verbal exercise undertaken in parallel, but not intrinsically related with, and much less with them, his acclaimed work as a distinguished thinker of counter-hegemonic alternatives in both several academic disciplines and concrete historical situations we are currently engaged with. Rather, I propose, this is the hypothesis I would like to share with you this morning, Rather, I propose that Boventura's poetry has not only been an intrinsic force in the development of his theoretical work, but also it has favored one of the most admired traits of Boventura's Entretien en Fini, that is to say, his vast bibliography. I am referring, as you already probably guessed, to his uncommon theoretical imagination unfolded in a wealth of new concepts, as well as powerful metaphors. To put it bluntly, bluntly, or even better, let us listen to the Manifesto da Escrita Incapaz, the Manifesto of the Incapable Writing, published in 2004. A arte incapaz é uma arte que não cria nem se contém em si própria pretende apenas provocar a imaginação artística dos outros e servir-lhes de matéria-prima. A sua capacidade imaginativa não reside nela, mas no que puder gerar em outras manifestações artísticas. The incapable art is an art that neither creates nor contains itself. It only aims at triggering the artistic imagination of others and to provide them with feedstock. Its imaginative capability does not reside in itself, but in what it may engender in other artistic manifestations. <coughs> Thus, the incapable art rescues and at the same time brings forward the insight of one of the most inspiring post abyssal authors of one letter, William Shakespeare. In the prologue of the third act of Henry V, the spectators are asked to perform a special task, so says the actor in the prologue, is to be kind and eke out our performance with your mind. You follow me, I am sure. Shakespeare, Shakespeare's theater and Boventura's poetry have always already been post absal much before the concept conceptualization of the modus operandi of Western culture. There is no room for absal lines when borders between actors and spect spectators, authors and readers, painters and beholders, musicians and listeners are put into brackets. However, that's not enough to say. I need to take another step. 
As a matter of fact, a decisive one in the reading I am proposing of the centrality of Boaventura's poetry to his entire intellectual project. There is, in the sense put forward by Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari, a fascinating conceptual character in Boaventura's poetry, a dog named the King, whose special vantage point allows the poet to see the world for the first time with, so to speak, hungry, but not necessarily angry eyes. Let us, let us read a poem from the same book, whose voice is the dog's. King Cidade. Sou um flaner. Gosto de medir o movimento da cidade pelo pulso das formigas. É tão estranho que ninguém estranhe o que se passa. É bom subir nos telhados para ver que as telhas não estão dispostas hierarquicamente. King C. I am a flaner. I enjoy measuring the city's movement by the pulse of ants. It is so odd that no one finds odd what goes on. It is good to climb up the roof, to learn that the tiles are not disposed hierarchically. In order to understand the centrality of poetry in Boaventura's theoretical efforts, we have to conceive poetry as radical knowledge, indeed, a post-abyssal knowledge in its very structure. Wallace Stevens said it perfectly. A poet is concerned not with ideas about the thing, but what the thing itself. And the uniqueness of this sort of experience is encapsulated in the famous two last lines of the poem. It's still far away. It was like a new knowledge of reality. This point is crucial for Poetry has been historically deprived of its cognitive potential due to a historical process which took place primarily at the universities. As we all know, the reinvention of the modern university in the early 19th century happened in Germany and led to the restructuring of the University of Berlin according to the project devised by Wilhelm von Humboldt which brought together teaching and researching for the first time as intrinsic parts of the university system. In the course of the 19th century, its further development imposed a clear-cut distinction, in Boaventura's terms, an abyssal line between Naturwissenschaften and Geisterswissenschaften. This distinction, systematized by Wilhelm Dutheil, as a powerful abyssal line, was a powerful abyssal line because it implied a harsh hierarchy between natural sciences and human sciences, privileging the former natural sciences. In this context, poetry could not but be reduced to its alleged aesthetic value, devoid of any serious epistemological claim, tamed in its post abyssal potential. Once more, King, the dog, voices the uniqueness of Boaventura's poetic experience. O importante é ser-se especialista do que não acontece. What matters is to be an expert of what does not happen. The radicality of this post abyssal predicament may be better appreciated by reading Boaventura's definition of the concept. Modern Western thinking is an abyssal thinking. It consists of visible and invisible distinctions, the invisible ones being the foundation of the visible ones. The invisible distinctions are established through radical lines that divide social reality into two realms, the realm of this side of the line and the realm of the other side of the line. The division is such that the other side of the line vanishes as reality, 
becomes non-existent and is indeed produced as non-existent. To be an expert of what does not happen brings together Boaventura's King and Jorge Luis Borges' Pierre Menard. In his well-known short story, Pierre Menard, Author of Quixote, Borges contrasts Pierre Menard's visible and invisible work, but only to give a pride of place to the invisible one. After all, as it is clarified in the opening of the narrative, and I quote, the visible work left by this novelist easily and briefly enumerated, that is to say, a work that does not caught, caught the attention of Jorge Luis Borges. And after all, what really matters is, is what has not happened. This is, and that truly mesmerizes the narrator, is Pierre Menard's invisible work. Again, in the words of the narrator, I turn now to this other work, the underground, the interminably heroic, the peerless, and such are the capacities of man, the unfinished work of Pierre Menard. This privileging of the invisible work at the expense of the visible one demanded the development, and I quote again, of a new technique, that of the deliberate anachronism and the er erroneous attribution. In other words, a post abyssal method par excellence because it simply erases binary distinctions, propitiating thought experiments such as the one we can find in the final stanza of the poem State Street, published in Medson e Outros Lugares in 1989, this emblematic watershed year. A ausência é estar aqui sempre que nada me falte. Absence is to be here, not missing anything. There is a subtle distinction in German that help us to unfold, that helped me to unfold my argument, bringing it to a conclusion. I am referring to the distance between Gedicht and Dichtung. Gedicht has a straightforward definition in any standard dictionary. Gedicht translates as poem, that is to say, a literary work which belongs to the genre of lyric and most often is structured is divided in lines and stanzas. Thus, Gedicht is a codified, identifiable form. Rather, Dichtung, and this is an important point, Dichtung cannot either be contained in one single form or be limited to one specific genre. It actually conveys the Greek poiesis as a human ability to give shape to things. In Nelson Goodman's famous turn of phrase, Dichtung is a way of world making through words. You know where I'm going. Dichtung is the word to seize Boventura's poetry. This possibility was keenly announced by Theodor Adorno's well known statement, uh, well known statement on how it would be barbaric to write a poem after Auschwitz. In his words, and we only quote the original because of one specific <laughs> word, so says Adon, nach Auschwitz ein Gedicht zu schreiben ist barbarisch. Almost all translations, if not all, at least all the translations that I know, insist in rendering Gedicht as poetry. So everyone refers to Adorno's essay and Adorno's statement as, is it possible to write poetry after Auschwitz? Adorno has not written poetry, but Gedicht, poem. And that makes all the difference. Adorno clearly meant poem, Gedicht. That is a fixed form, confident in a supposed universal and transhistorical aesthetic value, which was precisely undermined, if not destroyed, by the historical disaster of the World Wars. Overcoming this misleading translation, we could suggest that after Auschwitz, 
Dichtung, poesis, poetry, in its post abyssal potential, has become more needed than ever. After all, we need urgently a radical form of thinking through the contemporary dilemmas. If dictum, that is poiesis in Greek, is a radical form of knowledge, no one synthesized it better than Ezra Pound in his ABC of Reading, whose famous expression, uh, equation is state, stated, dictum equal condensare. And if dictum is a radical form of knowledge, then let us go back to the roots, namely, let us iman imagine an archaeology of the uh, abyssal thinking in the expulsion of the poets from Plato's utopic city, as it occurs in the Republic, in the Book Tenth. But we shall recall that the poet is expelled of the city because of the powerful effects produced by his mimesis, his imitative poetry in the minds of the listeners and the readers. Instead of searching, and the effect mainly was, instead of searching for the university, university of meaning sponsored by the concept, this war machine of philosophy, Dictum multiplied the possibilities of meaning, opening up as many roads as listeners available, favoring the never-ending structure of a work in progress. In Bodenturas' terms, poetry is a radical alternative way to think radical alternatives. It is a post-abyssal thought experiment since its inception. In its etymologies of the South's justice against epistemicide, Bodenturas offered a concise definition. I designate epistemicide the murder of knowledge. If I am not mistaken, Boventura's uh, poetry has always already been an instance of his battle against epistemicide, and even before he had conceptualized the phenomenon. In this case, and with the invaluable uh, aid of another philosopher, not King Bob, but King, we may conclude by reading together the epigram 16. Diz a seis. O meu amigo King diz-me que o mundo está preocupado comigo. Não entendo. Eu é que estou preocupado com o mundo. Pergunto-lhe se há alguém que se preocupe com ambos. 16. My friend King tells me the world is concerned about me. I do not understand. I am the one who is concerned about the world. I ask him if there is anyone concerned about the birth of us. Muito obrigado.